What I want to do right now is something different than that. I want to pull back and try to give a picture of the whole. You know, throughout the Bible made up of so many parts, there is one whole. And we need to keep this in mind, particularly if we want to preach Christ from every text, rather than forcing in analogies that aren't there, if we get in in mind the, the picture of the whole Bible and we see kind of where our text is located on the map and how it contributes to the older overall story, we'll do a much better job of naturally preaching the, the meaning, the plain meaning of Scripture in its context. And I do just want to say, see because, say, because I see this crowd is as large as it is, if you're here today and you're not a Christian, I well understand how you might be here on a Friday morning, pretty, sitting inside a building, listening to talks on the Bible. You came with a friend. Uh, somebody said, hey, this, this guy, uh, maybe one of the others is going to be speaking, he's a good speaker. You want to hear this guy? And so you turned up. Friend, think carefully about what this means for you. I really want you to get the message of the Bible, and I think if you get the message of the Bible, you may find the message of the Bible gets you. This this book is not a passive book. God speaks through this book. Every single one of us who's in this room who's a Christian can tell you that we have been grabbed by God, that when we were living our lives in, in rebellion against Him, some at a young age, some at an older age, God arrested us on our way to hell. And he grabbed us through the message of the gospel. I love what Martin Luther said, the Bible is alive, it speaks to me. It has feet, it runs after me. It has hands, it lays hold on me. I pray that happens to each one of us this morning. Now listen, just a note before we go on, because I'm talking to a lot of preachers, I want to just point out a few good books that are out there these days for helping you think through the Bible as a whole. There are a lot of them. On the doctrine of the Bible and thinking of it clearly as God's Word, J.I. Packer's book, God Has Spoken, is excellent. If you've never looked at that, J.I. Packer, God Has Spoken. Also, about the the shortest book around these days that I can think of that will introduce you to sort of biblical theology overall, the overarching story of the Bible, is Vaughn Roberts' God's Big Picture. Uh, Vaughn's an evangelical minister in Oxford, England. It's a series of sermons he preached in his own church, very accessible. It's the kind of thing you can use with the leadership in your church. Also, uh, what's become a kind of contemporary classic, I think, in our circles, Graham Goldsworthy's little Gospel and Kingdom. Now, the publishers figured out that if they put it in the Goldsworthy trilogy, we'd have to buy all three, but I'm just saying it's in there, the Goldsworthy trilogy, that Gospel and Kingdom is a great little volume to give you an introduction to this. Uh, Also, uh, the late Ed Clowney, his book, The Unfolding Mystery, does a great job of focusing on Christ throughout the Bible, The Unfolding Mystery. And let me just mention one more, Michael Lawrence's book, Biblical Theology in the Life of the Church a guide for ministry. Uh, This has just come out with Crossway. Uh, Actually, we hope to give everybody a copy of this tonight. So if you're back tonight, you should be getting a copy of this one tonight. Um, This is a wonderful, wonderful uh, book to basically just take us through the story of the Bible. Actually, Matt Chandler, can you give us a quick testimonial? Somebody's going to give you a handheld microphone. Quick testimonial on the utility of this book, if we have a handheld microphone. Mm, maybe we do, maybe we don't. I thought we had a couple right here. Or just come right up here. So they don't need to buy it, they're going to get it, but tell them what use it would be. Um, well, we, we found it to be an excellent book at the village. In fact, our elders are currently walking through it uh, in regards to just tying all the pieces together. Uh, I don't know of a, a more readable um, uh, book uh, introduction into biblical theology. In fact, I've been calling it a practical guide to biblical theology. Um, and so I, we found it to be an excellent tool uh, for our elders and staff. So Great. Thanks, brother. Those last two chapters, preaching and teaching case studies and biblical theology in the local church, are highly practical. So if you need to be convinced of the utility of that and how it could apply to you know, leaders in a local church, you read the last two chapters first. And, and then I think you'll see that pretty clearly. Anyway, those are some resources to help. Now let me just try to do this... Uh, verbally for a little while. I want to talk about the Old Testament first and then the New Testament. And when you talk about the Old Testament as a whole, I found it really useful to think of that image that I use in that title as promises made. Promises made. Not everyone who's looked at the Bible has looked at it as a whole. I mean, we know that. If you know your church history, toward, toward the end of the second century, the followers of a man called Marcion uh, cut the Bible up Uh, These Marcionites had broken off relations with other Christians in the second century. He rejected the whole Old Testament. He rejected parts of the New Testament, too. I think they accepted only Luke and maybe 
10 of Paul's letters. Uh, and, and the reason he did it is the reason a lot of people around us today, it's some of the images they have of the Bible, Marcion thought the God of the Old Testament was cruel. He was wrathful. He was inconsistent with what God was revealed as being in Jesus of Nazareth. And so Marcion took the uh, step with integrity and consistency of kind of living up to what he really thought and just cut out most of the Bible. Now, Christians universally rejected this kind of radical surgery which threw out the Bible that Jesus and the apostles used. You know, we get our view of the Old Testament from Jesus himself. And that's where we ground its authority. He saw the Old Testament for what it was, and he used it as that. And that's what we need to do in our own churches. But we have to, we have to admit that even if you consider like how many of us are preaching through the New Testament, I'm in a New Testament series right now, we have to ask ourselves, how much in our churches do we give attention to the Old Testament? We may not make theological statements about rejecting the Old Testament, but the effect is the same. I mean, we often just simply ignore it. I mean, maybe we, maybe we mine the Old Testament for some good stories, you know, First and Second Samuel, you know, or Genesis, some stories about Joseph or David or, or Moses or Elijah, maybe Daniel, the lion's den. We look for some good stories of bravery or devotion that we or our children, maybe we're teaching Sunday school, they can emulate. We may learn to quote some psalms, memorize some proverbs, maybe selectively commend some of the Old Testament's rules and regulations. But on the whole, with the Old Testament, most Christians today in America simply ignore it. But I think to ignore the Old Testament is to ignore the basis, the foundation of the Bible. So if, if you're here in this room and you're a Christian, you should realize that God's wonderful revelation of Himself in Christ is recorded in the New Testament, but the context for understanding the prophecies and the nation of Israel, God's work with other peoples, His work in history, His opposition to sin, His teaching them about the connection between sin and death. I mean, I could just go on and on and on. All of these things which form the setting for the coming of Christ are taught in the Old Testament. Countless allusions and verbal battles and parables and prejudices can barely be understood when we read them in the Gospels without understanding the great story of what God has done in the Old Testament. Here's how I explained it to a friend this week who's just come to Christ in the last few months. He was, uh, he was asking me about the Old Testament and, and why it was so important. He's reading the Old Testament right now. And I said, you know, it's kind of like uh, this one illustration I got when I was at Cambridge. I had lunch with a guy who was a student at King's College, Cambridge, right after World War II. He was an undergrad there. If any of you have ever been to Cambridge in England, you'll know it's a, a town of beautiful buildings. The most beautiful of all, I think, is King's College Chapel, this huge Gothic structure with the largest expanse of stained glass window from the Renaissance in all of Europe. Well, when they knew the bombings were going to start, they took the, all the windows down in 39 or 40, and they hid them uh, underground in barns around East Anglia, that part of England. But after the war, they got the money together, and it took a while to put them back in, 45, 46, 40, by 47, they get it all back in, but they've, they've, they've just been all boarded up with wood, these spectacular windows, for, for eight years now. And they, they, uh, as they're putting the last ones in place, they have the whole thing. It's been covered by fabric. Uh, and they gather all the students out in the courtyard, and they put spotlights inside the chapel. And then at night, when they've got the last bit of glass in, they have this great celebration where they they drop all the draperies and they turn on all the floodlights from inside the building and the light flows out and floods the windows and then floods the air as they watch these amazing windows that actually show the story of the Bible. Just come alive through the light. All right, here's the image I gave John this week. The New Testament, without knowing your Old Testament, is like those beautiful stained glass windows. It's all there and it's stunning. With the Old Testament, that's like the floodlights coming from behind, filling those windows and bringing out the meaning and spectacular color. Friends, you want to have an affection for God and for everything He has bothered to reveal about Himself. And as you do that, it will bring rewards to you in the richness and depth of your understanding. Goldsworthy always uses the phrase, God's people in God's place under God's rule. God's people in God's place under God's rule. That's what's going on from the Garden of Eden, through the Ark, through the nation of Israel, the wandering Babylon, resettling from exile. Uh, that's what they're looking for as they go into the New Testament. Well, I want to suggest three quick headings for understanding what's going on in the Old Testament. First, a particular history. Second, a passion for holiness. Third, a promise of hope. 
Let me give you those again. First, a particular history. Second, a passion for holiness. Third, a promise of hope. I think you can hang the whole Old Testament on that. So if, if I need a text for this morning, let's, let's just open our Bibles and go to page one. Page one, unless you have a, an unusually bad copy of the Bible. That stuff before page one is not inspired. But I want you to turn back a few pages before your page one to the table of contents. Let's just stare at that for a second. While I've got this instant uh, flash poll available to me, you don't need to stand this time, just put up your hands. If your table of contents is in two columns, raise your hand. All right, if your table of contents is in three columns, raise your hand. If your table of contents is something other, raise your hand. Hmm, that's interesting. All right. Well, if you look at the table of contents, you see there the books of, of the Old and New Testament. Let's just look at those Old Testament books for just a second. And what you're struck with immediately, if you know your Bibles at all, is that you see a particular history. Because the Bible is not just a book full of wise religious counsel or spiritual propositions, though it, it has both, the Bible's a saga. It's an epic. And the story of the Old Testament is amazing. You know, I mean, you've got nothing and then something. That's the most amazing way any story ever began. Nothing and then something. You've got inanimate creation and then life. You've got creatures and then man in God's image. You've got Eden and then the fall. As some people have called the third chapter of Genesis the most important chapter in the whole Bible. You know, with that gone, uh, all the rest would be meaningless. Anyway, from then you have disintegration till Cain, uh, from Cain rather, till Noah. And with Noah, still disintegration down to the Tower of Babel. And then, of course, you have Abraham and brief prosperity and then slavery. Then the Exodus with Moses and the law and the promised land and then all the confusion under the judges and then the kingdom under David you got then his son Solomon then Rehoboam and then the division and you have all the terrible idolatry and the destruction of the northern kingdom Israel and the destruction of Judah uh, the exile then the return and then there they're left needy pitiful reduced just to, to utter dependence friends all of that is recorded in these first 39 books of the Old Testament and it's not just one book. It is one book. God is the author. But it is also a collection of 39 smaller books that make up the whole, and they're quite different. You know, three traditional categories of books you'll see if you look there, your table of contents. You have those first books, which we think of as the law, and then you have the writings in the middle of the Old Testament, and then the prophets. So if you look in the middle of the Old Testament, um, if you draw a line kind of at your table of contents mentally before Job and after the Song of Solomon, you see these three divisions of the Old Testament. Draw that line before Job and after the Song of Solomon. So that first from Genesis all the way to Esther is, is, is one division. It's the law and the law and the histories. In the middle one you just marked off mentally is from Job to the Song of Solomon. That's called the writings. And then that final one from Isaiah to the end is called the prophets. So there are 17 books in that group of the law and the histories, five in that middle group, and 17 in the last group. So in the law books, really at the heart of it all are those five books of the law, the Pentateuch, and after them the 12 books of what we might more often think of as history. And taken together, these first 17 books, they form the narrative about the history of God with His people from the beginning of creation to the generation where the Jews returned to Jerusalem from the Babylonian exile all the way to 400 years before Christ. Now that's all right there. Now do the people in your church know that? That's pretty simple. You could tell them that little bit in about two minutes. Do you realize how that just might orient your people after 20 years of Bible stories? And I go, oh, so this fits here and this fits here. That's what's going on. Friends, think about giving them simple information like that. Now, those middle five books are known as the writings. They focus on some of the more personal experiences. They kind of figuratively form the heart of the Old Testament. Uh, they're largely a collection from the Old Testament period of, of wisdom, uh, devotional poems, uh, ceremonial pieces from the temple. And then the last 17 books are the prophets. So if the first 17 are the narratives, then what happens in the middle group is experience. This last group is kind of God's commentary on Israel's history. God's commentary on Israel's history. So very often if you're reading something in the historical books, in those first 17 books, you can find some inspired by the Holy Spirit comment on it in these last 17 books. You want to get yourself familiar with them.
So the Old Testament is a very clear, specific, earthy revelation of God. You, you know what it's like maybe when you're hiring to get a, a, a resume? And you know how that's different than actually working with a person. Well, in the Old Testament, we get not only the resume, but we get the accounts of God actually working with His people. In this history, we see much of what it means to be God's people. We see much of what God's like. And that brings us to the second thing that I want us to notice from the Old Testament. If we understand the Old Testament, not only must we understand the particular history of Israel, but we must also see, and if you're taking notes, this would be that, that second of those subpoints for the Old Testament, a passion for holiness which God has in it. When you read the Old Testament, you cannot miss God's righteousness. A lot of people associate the Old Testament with portraying God as angry. They think of Him as unjust. But friends, nothing could be further from the truth. I'll have more to say about this maybe in just a minute, but I think we come to understand the stories about God better as we understand more of God's character. The stories start to make sense. So last Sunday in our church, last Sunday morning in our church up in D.C., we celebrated the Lord's Supper. Uh, and as we always do, we read those words from the New Testament, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Jesus said that. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Where do you get that language? It's straight out of the Old Testament. There's a lot of language in the Old Testament about the covenant. Well, this kind of covenant language may sound cold and legal if, if you don't know much about it, but it's not that at all. The language of covenant is the language of relationship. It's like the covenant you make in marriage. It's that, that agreement that these people will interact carefully and faithfully together. And that's exactly what happens in the covenant relationship in the Old Testament. And what comes out in that covenant relationship throughout the pages of the Old Testament, we see that God has a passion for holiness. He has a passion for holiness. We see this especially clearly in the problem that sin causes in relating to God. And it's in considering our sin that the Bible's language of atonement comes in. You know, our English word atonement uh, is actually has Anglo-Saxon roots. It's not Greek or Latin. It's just very simple, at one meant. It just means literally to reconcile, to, to bring opposing parties together. Now, this idea of atonement was not unique to Israel among the nations. The idea of placating a deity was common. But the Old Testament put this idea of placating the God in the context of a relationship. And so they would speak in terms of reconciliation. So when we see God being angry in the Old Testament, you can be sure that it is not a kind of whimsical tyranny as the volcano goes off. But it is an expression of God's commitment to His own holy character and His implacable opposition to human sin. It was because sin so separated people from people from God in the first place that we need to be reconciled. So, does the Old Testament present an angry God? Yes. But it is a God who is angry exactly because He is not indifferent to sin, but He is angry at the destruction of His creation. Brother, pastor, surely I'm not alone here in weeping tears over seeing the destruction wrought certainly among the in the world at large and among non-Christians, but even among God's own people, as we see the ravages of sin, as we consider our own hearts. It's clear in the Old Testament that all men are sinners. The Old Testament teaches that. 1 Kings 8, 46, Psalm 14, 3, Proverbs 20, verse 9, Ecclesiastes 7, verse 20. Go to a systematic theology, you can find more. And, and yet at the same time that man is not able to deal with sin himself. That's our problem then. The Old Testament presents this huge problem. Sin has broken divine commandments, needed some reparation. How can this be? It seems that because of God's holiness, peace with God must be restored by dealing with God's just condemnation of the person who wickedly breaks God's law. This seems to be clear in the Old Testament. Atonement became linked to sacrifice as the way provided by God to restore that relationship by making reparation. But now in the Old Testament, we have not just people pitifully trying to propitiate a volcano, you know, where you have human initiative, like it was in the, in the cultures around them, just blindly, maybe this will help. But what we've got in the Old Testament, amazingly, is a God who's real, and He's alive, and He has actually spoken, telling those who have sinned against Him how they can come back. He has made a way back to himself. 
when we could not make a way. It would have been impossible for us to do that. This atonement is the means of establishing reconciliation. So there, there are lots of particular themes and commands in the Old Testament that have to do with the atonement. I just want to mention specifically the, the practices prescribed. Particularly, when you read the Old Testament, notice all the sacrifices. In the Old Testament, the idea of sacrifice seems to be innate. You know, immediately after creation in Genesis, Cain and Abel offer sacrifices. But then, of course, you have the Passover lamb in Exodus 12, which was to be without defect when it was slaughtered. Its blood was to mark the houses for salvation from God's just requirement of the lives of the firstborn who were representatives for the whole family. You see, the object of this exercise was clearly God and His satisfaction. It's very interesting. When you look there in Exodus 12, I don't know if if you've preached through Exodus and you've noticed this, but God says, when I see the blood. You know, there were liberal theology professors at various institutions in the middle of the 20th century and on into even when I was in school who was teaching that God is not wrathful and we shouldn't use the word propitiation, we should only use the word expiation. But friends, The Bible teaches clearly that God's wrath is personal and His satisfaction will be personal when I see the blood. The book of of Leviticus emphasizes the restoration of the people's relationship with God. All the offerings must be voluntary. They must be costly. They must be the offerer's own. They must be accompanied with a confession of sin according to God's prescriptions. And here's another important distinction from the other ancient sacrifices. Biblically, sacrifices were not to be brought by, by the grateful, but by the guilty. They were not brought by the ignorant, but by the instructed. The life of the animal victim symbolized by their blood was required in exchange for the life of that human worshiper. Oh, friends, this is such a rich vein to preach in. Leon Morris's book, The Atonement, Leon Morris, The Atonement, is a wonderful book to clearly and simply give you this kind of background. Leon Morris, The Atonement. It'll clarify your understanding and enrich your teaching of God's Word at this point. But what God was doing, He was implanting in His people's mind the symbolic expression of the innocent given for the guilty. The innocent given for the guilty. Putting it deep in their minds as a people. You know, through all those regulations about sacrifices, you see the the victims must be unblemished. They must be costly. The life of the sacrifice must be taken. Do you see what he's doing? Do you see how he's building a lock that the key will be in Christ? The Old Testament is what builds this lock. It helps us to see the truth about our state and about what God is doing. God told the people that the life of the creature is in the blood, and I have given it to you to make atonement for yourselves on the altar. It is the blood that makes atonement for one's life. Now, I know the whole idea of sacrifice is unpopular with many today, but my point is to say how the Old Testament shows God's holiness by expressing God's wrath at sin. These sacrifices in the Old Testament in and of themselves were never the point. Uh, You can see that in lots of ways. You can read Jeremiah chapter 7. You can go read the book of Hebrews in the New Testament. Sacrifices were most appropriate, ironically, when they were done realizing that they were not effective except by God's grace. What these sacrifices were doing were teaching the people that sin is defiling. Teaching them the truth about God being holy and about us being sinful. That's what's happening in these sacrifices. That's why the Old Testament temple was designed the way it was. It physically showed that sin hinders our access to God. These sacrifices also showed that purification would be needed. And that sin is so serious that death is needed to atone. So any salvation or forgiveness would be costly. These annual sacrifices show that the people were in a state of sin. There was no perfect sacrifice in the Old Testament. It emphasized that God is holy, so sin separates us from God, but that He provides the way of access and that the just forgiveness of our sins is essential for that access. Now, this raises the question that seems to me the riddle of the whole Old Testament. If you want to summarize the Old Testament in a single question, turn to Exodus 34, look at verses 6 and 7, star it in your margin, use this. Exodus 34, verses 6 and 7. This is, in my mind, the riddle of the whole Old Testament. Where the Lord said to Moses, The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, 
slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin, yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. Friend, think about that as you're going to bed tonight. How do all those parts fit together? How did Moses understand that? How did the Israelites understand that? How did people throughout the Old Testament understand that? That brings me to the last thing we have to understand from the Old Testament, and that is this promise of hope, this promise of hope of God's redemption of His people. You see, the Old Testament picture of God is not a picture of an uncaring God of grim condemnation, but the God we see in the Old Testament is the God of the New Testament. God is shown to not only be holy and just in His unwavering commitment to oppose and punish sin, but God is also seen to be a God of love even towards His enemies. Have you ever noted all the verses in the Bible about loving your enemies in the Old Testament? If you've got a secular friend who uses that Old Testament, New Testament divide at you sometimes, oh, I don't like the angry God of your Bible, you know, the Old Testament, you just memorize some of those verses about loving your enemies from the Old Testament. Friends, in the Old Testament, we see God's loving forbearance from His not ending human history at the fall, all the way to His persevering with the wayward nation of Israel for centuries, even millennia. In the Old Testament, we see God's grace, His love, His mercy, His patience on an epic scale. Centuries of God's loving, faithful, patient, compassionate mercy. It seems that throughout history, God planned and promised to reveal His glory to His people, and so He did. But I I said that to understand the Old Testament, we have to see the promise of hope. What hope? It seems all we've done is review God's commitment to His holiness and His His people's Failure to live up to that requirement. What hope is this? Well, friend, the hope is not in their history. As we've seen, it was a failure. Nor even finally in the sacrificial system. You know, as the psalmist said, sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but my ears you have pierced. Meaning, but you've made me your own. And he goes on in that vein. There seems even in the Old Testament to be the same insight that we see in Hebrews chapter 10. The law never can, by the same sacrifices repeated endlessly year after year, make perfect those who draw near to worship. If it could, would would they not have stopped being offered? For the worshipers would have been cleansed once for all and would no longer have felt guilty for their sins. But those sacrifices are an annual reminder of sins because because it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Okay, so then what hope is there that Exodus 34, 6 and 7 could be true? How could the Lord forgive witness, uh, forgive wickedness and yet still not leave the guilty unpunished? How could He do that? Well, the answer wasn't in themselves, but in God and His promise, particularly the promised person. In the Old Testament, we've seen that hope would require a propitiation to assuage the righteous wrath of God that it would require a substitution of suffering and death on the part of an innocent for the deserved punishment of the guilty, and that it would require some relation between the offerer and the victim. Now, in Jesus' day, people were not wondering whether a Messiah would come. They took it for granted that their only hope was the specially anointed one of God, the Messiah. Uh, that the Lord had promised through Moses. The Lord will raise up a prophet, Deuteronomy 18. It's the promise that is the answer to the riddle. It's the promise that is the hope of the Old Testament. In fact, what the whole Old Testament would teach us more than anything else is that this promise is our only hope at all. If this promise is not fulfilled, we have no hope. We have centuries of God's dealing with His people to show that in the Old Testament. And friends, that's where we come to the New Testament, where we see God's promise made is kept. God's promise is kept. The nation of Israel waxed and waned for almost two millennia until their once high hopes had almost vanished as their nation appeared once again crushed by an alien invader, this time over 2,000 years ago, the mighty Roman Empire. At that time, they were feeling disappointment to the point of despair. I mean, what of all their old hopes? It's interesting, if you read rabbinical literature from that period between the Old and New Testaments, they knew the heavens were brassy, that God had been silent. What was going on? 
Would this deliverer never come? Would they never be restored to fellowship with God? Would the world never be put right? All of these things had been promised to God's people in the centuries before the Romans invaded Israel. The New Testament is the story of how all these promises made by God were kept. All of them. And the difference that that makes to you and me in our disappointments and our hopes. So, I want to just consider the, the New Testament more briefly, just as kind of three concentric circles that I think might be useful. First, Christ as the, as the heart, the core of the fulfillment of these promises. And then one more fur, circle further out, the covenant people of God. And then the furthest out circle, indeed, the renewal of all of creation. So first, would their deliverer ever come? The New Testament answers these promises made in the Old Testament with a resounding yes. And at the very center of the New Testament is the focus on this promised person, the Messiah, Christ. In all of history and before, we, we read in the New Testament, God had planned to send Christ. God had a plan in creation. Even though Adam and Eve rebelled against God's rightful rule, God's plan would not be thwarted in this tattered remnant of Israel that we see at the time of the Roman occupation. The hope inspired by God of a coming deliverer, the Messiah, the Christ, was still there. God had put it there. And if you look at the New Testament, this collection of 27 books, of course, begins with these four accounts of the life of the Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth. The Gospels are presenting to their readers the tremendous news that the Messiah has actually come the one for whom God's people had been waiting. So where, where Adam sinned and, and Israel failed, there Jesus came and was faithful. Jesus survived the temptations. He was tempted just as we are, we're told, but without sin. Here is the, the prophet promised by Moses, the king prefigured by David, even the divine Son of Man from Daniel 7. He's come in Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus is the Word of God made flesh according to John 1. The book of Acts then shows Jesus continuing to be active through His church from the ascension of Jesus through to Paul's imprisonment in Rome as the church keeps expanding to all creation, sort of pointing out, out, out. And then throughout the New Testament, we're taught that we have different promises made in the Old Testament, all kept in Jesus. In 2 Corinthians, we see Jesus is the new Adam. In 2 Peter, we see Jesus is the righteous one. In John 8, Abraham rejoiced to see his day. John 1, he's greater than Moses. Matthew 22, he's greater than David. Friends, Christ is the point of the whole Bible. He is the promised deliverer. And not just for the Old Testament people of God, but for us here this morning as well. That's the heart, uh, the, the core, the innermost meaning of the New Testament. Now, because of God Himself coming in Christ, because Christ perfectly displays God's own image, He is the fulfillment of those promises. But you remember, we're also told in Genesis that all humans are made in God's image. We're made to particularly reflect His image to His creation. And this is the sort of second circle of the New Testament beyond Jesus Christ if we understand the New Testament is about Jesus Christ, you see it beginning there in the gospel so clearly, but what does Jesus do? This promised person makes a promised provision for his special covenant people. We thought a few minutes ago about the, the covenant language in the Old Testament and about how it wasn't called legal language, but it was the language of relationship. What we find in the New Testament is that as we recall when we celebrate the Lord's Supper, Jesus came with a purpose. He knew what He was doing. He came in order to make a new covenant in His blood. That's what He came to do, to build this relationship then of His people with God. Christ was the fulfillment of the hopes of the Old Testament for the Messiah as prophet, speaking the truth of God, as king ruling God's people. He was also the fulfillment of their hopes for a priest. Jesus said, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. And Jesus meant Himself. Jesus Christ is the meeting place. Jesus is the temple for these new people of God. He is the mediator between them and God. So, back to the riddle of the Old Testament, Exodus 34, 6 and 7. 
How could it be true? How could the Lord forgive wickedness and yet still not leave the guilty unpunished? Friends, the answer to be, is to be found, of course, in Jesus. You see how the whole Bible has set up that answer. It is Jesus. Jesus. He taught his disciples after the resurrection. In the end of Luke's gospel, look at Luke 24, verse 27. Beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. And then down to verse 45. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written, the Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in His name to all nations, beginning in Jerusalem. One of the things we want to do in our time together in these next couple of days is consider Isaiah 53. And you remember in Isaiah 53, the Lord had promised this, surely He took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows, yet we considered Him stricken by God, smitten by Him, and afflicted. But He was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon Him, and by His wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to His own way, and the Lord has laid on Him the iniquity of us all. Friends, this is what Christ did. As He taught His disciples, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give His life as a ransom for many. As Peter said in the first Christian sermon in Acts 2, Men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge. And you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. So there is in Christ giving Himself for the people the most amazing combination of strength and complete self-giving. I love that sort of corner turn in the book of Revelation, you know, over in Revelation chapter 5, when John is just being introduced into the vision. He sees the great throne there in heaven. And then in chapter, five, in, in chapter 4 and then in chapter 5, the scroll is brought out. And of course, the scroll has what, what's, what's the future going to be? What, what is God's plan? But no one can open it. He says in, in Revelation 5, 4, I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll, to look inside. Who will make God's purposes known? Who will fulfill them and bring them to pass? And then one of the elders said to me, do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and its seven seals. Then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing in the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. Friends, isn't that amazing? He hears about a lion. He hears these prophecies of a lion. And he turns and he looks, and what does he see? He sees a lamb looking as if it had been slain. You see what John is saying, what the Holy Spirit is saying to us there. The lion is the lamb. The lion is the lamb. This is how God has done things. This is a most amazing way of, of the way he makes his, his strength perfect in Paul's weakness. This is the way our God works. This is what he's done in Christ. Christ has died as a lamb, as a substitute. So friend, if you're here and you're not a Christian, the basic news of the Bible is that you are in deep trouble because God is good. All of us have done what we should not have done. All of us have sinned against God. That is, we've done what we've wanted rather than what He's wanted. And in His amazing love and forbearance and mercy, He has come Himself. The eternal Son of God has taken on flesh and has been made a man, Jesus of Nazareth, fully God and yet fully man. And He lived a life of perfect trust and reliance on His heavenly Father. The way you and I should have lived lives of perfect trust and reliance on God, and none of us have. And because we haven't, when God has done nothing to deserve our lack of trust, because we haven't lived those kind of lives, God will punish because He is holy, He is righteous. But His punishment will fall on Christ. In fact, it has done so for everyone who will turn from their sins and trust in Him. Friend, if you today will repent of your sins, turn from them and trust in Christ as your Savior, you can be forgiven of all your sins. You can be filled with God's own Spirit this riddle of the Old Testament of how God could actually forgive the wicked by leaving His punishment on one who was not guilty but who became guilty 
Paul says in 2 Corinthians, was made sin for us. Friends, you can know that kind of peace with God today. If you want to know more about that, you don't need to come forward. You're in a room full of preachers. When we break at the panel discussion, just talk to somebody near you you like the look of. They would love to talk to you about this good news of Jesus Christ because this is what the New Testament is about. You see, it's in Christ that we can be made acceptable to God. It's in Christ that we're made holy. The very thing that God's people throughout the Old Testament would never be on their own holy, now in Christ, God has a remnant. He has a nation. He has a people to praise Him with their lips and with their lives of holiness. He has a new covenant people that are genuinely holy. And the New Testament is all about the salvation of people from their sin to this holiness. So Paul wrote to the Ephesian Christians about how they had been saved in Ephesians 2, and to the Corinthian Christians about how they were being saved in 1 Corinthians 1, and to the Christians in Rome, Rome about how they shall be saved in Romans 5. Christians are counted as holy in Christ, as being made holy even now, and we can know that we will someday actually be fully holy ourselves thanks to the work of God. This is what he's doing. Do you see how this plan all fits together? As we open the Bible, we see the stark picture that the New Testament paints between the world and the kingdom of God. The world is marked by unbelief, the kingdom of God by faith. The world is marked by bondage and darkness, the, the, the covenant people by freedom and light. On the one hand is death, on the other is eternal life. The one hand is hate and fear, the other love. Our lives, apart from being in covenant with God in Christ, our lives are marked by lawlessness. But in Christ, we abide in Him. We are in God. Now, this special distinction between God's covenant people and the world, that distinction is what we pastors in this room have a special stewardship of. Do you understand that? You can care about how many you have in Sunday school. I'm not, not saying you should never do that, but you understand fundamentally, biblically, you have a special care of this distinction. Not because you don't want all of these people over here. You do. You want all the people in the world in the kingdom of light. We labor with that with all our energy. But we know that that is not the case. And we know that part of the way these people are going to come over into the kingdom of light is by seeing it. And that's where God's special covenant people come in. Being holy, reflecting His character. When you read through the New Testament... You see what it means for us to be the covenant people of God. That's what the New Testament's about. You look at those table of contents in the New Testament, you look at all those names of those books. You know, you've got the Gospels at first about Jesus, and then the book of Acts as his work continues. This transmission, transition from the Gospels to the, the books about living as God's people as the Gospel expands outward from Jerusalem, Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria with those three missionary journeys of Paul then into the, to the ends of the world. All the rest of the books of the New Testament are letters, and they're letters about what it means to live as the special covenant people of God. The first 13 of those letters are written by Paul, rabbi of the stricter sort of Jews at the time, who was remarkably converted to God uh, on his way as he put it to persecute some Christians to their death. Then there are the second set of letters, eight of them written by others. And what we find when we read through these is that the promises made by God in the Old Testament had been kept in God's new covenant people. And if we're Christians, they're kept in us today as well. As Christians, you know, we often pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I love that prayer. Sometimes I think we're tempted to limit our hopes only to those things that we know we can fulfill in our own strength. Honestly, think of some of the things you've prayed for recently. Too many times we, we might have a, a member of our church share some prayer request with us, and in our own hearts we lack faith. We think, oh, I hope they don't pray that because then it's not going to happen and they're going to be disappointed. You ever notice that? How we become kind of brokers for Satan's doubt? <laughs> God is a wonderfully full God. He wants to bless us in the most amazing ways. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Christianity has always been full of prayers like that when Jesus prayed. We Christians have always had a hope that extends beyond ourselves, that exceeds what we could ever bring about by our own power. Paul wrote that we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth, the home of righteousness. That's Peter, 2 Peter chapter 1. This points to the fulfillment of the final, and really that first hope, 
the whole world being put right. As God's plan in the New Testament extends from Christ out to His covenant people to that outermost circle to His whole creation. So this is going to be my third sub-point for the New Testament. The whole creation. The point of history. The answer to why there is anything at all. This is what we find at the end of the New Testament, the conclusion, Revelation. It picks up the prophetic tradition of the Old Testament, but with some changes. Revelation is really the consummation of God's people in God's place in right relationship to Him as the church militant on earth becomes the church triumphant. The heavens and the earth are recreated. All the the glory of creation is refinished and represented, all tending to that great end of the Bible and of all of history, the glory of God Himself. That's why there's resurrection in the New Testament. We see that Jesus' resurrection is referred to as the first fruits. That means there's more coming. His is just the beginning of all the graves on the planet cracking open as the final resurrection has begun in the resurrection of Christ. It's very interesting in Revelation 21. I wonder if you've ever noticed that phrase in verse 24. When he's talking about that heavenly city, The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their splendor into it. What does that mean? I'm not sure. But it sounds great, doesn't it? (laughs) Kings bringing their splendor into it. Something of the glory of God in this fallen world is going to be saved and refurbished and add to God's glory ultimately and forever. His good work will be done. The holiness of God's people will finally be complete as as we're with Him. The Garden of Eden will be restored, only this time, as I'm I'm sure you've heard before, the Garden has become a city. Urbanization is not just a a current demographic trend in America. It's God's plan. It doesn't mean that Tom is called today to move from rural Alabama into Birmingham, but it does mean that God and His overall history of the people is bringing us to this great heavenly city where we are with Him and His people forever. And of course, preacher, I'm sure you've pointed out to your people before the dimensions of that heavenly city. You see it's a cube, which of course makes you think of what? From the Old Testament, because you've read your Old Testament, the Holy of Holies, where God's presence is there in an unmediated fashion with His people. Now all of us are brought into this Holy of Holies to be with God, not just a picture of it, but the real thing itself to be with God forever. And you come to the climax of the Bible there in Revelation 22, 4, they shall see His face. It's the climax of the Bible. What was taken away at creation by our sin is now restored through the blood of Christ as we come into His presence. I love that statement early in chapter 21, verse 3. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men and He will live with them. They will be His people and God Himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. Friends, this is the great news that we as Christians have to offer. We have great news. Great news that affects everyone. In our waiting time for this to be consummated, And we are now in that waiting time. I think it's very appropriate that the New Testament closes with this book. I love it. Written by an old man who's in exile. He himself is being oppressed by the Roman Empire. He is utterly desperate and he is utterly dependent. I don't know if any of you have ever had the privilege of being on the Isle of Patmos. I've been there. It's just a a rocky point in the Aegean Sea. It was not developed then, 2,000 years earlier, like it is today, I'm sure. He was there, maybe in a cave, tradition says. He had nothing. He had poured decades of his life into this church he loved in Ephesus. We see David's been at Providence for 30 years. David, how you must love that congregation, how how they must experience your care. You you planted that congregation by God's grace. All of us who are pastors, who have pastored 15 years, half that time, are you in your first year? You see how God begins to knit a love for your people in your heart? Imagine how John would have felt. He cared for that church in Ephesus for decades, now taken away. Would he see the fulfillment of all these promises that Jesus had made? Would he live to see this? And God gives him this vision. And that means this old man, desperate in exile and utterly dependent, is full of hope. He roars this prophecy out to the world. 
in no way intimidated by the might of the Roman Empire because he knows over all kings and emperors stands the Lord God Almighty, and he will reign. Now, friends, do you see what this has to do with us and our pastorates? Do you see what this has to do with the tenor of the Christian life in our churches? Do you see that what this has to do with us as we go through the challenges that we face in life with our brothers and sisters in the congregation who suffer? God's promises will be fulfilled. We are in this time of waiting, but He has shown us over a spectacular journey of thousands of years in His Word that He makes promises and then He waits over long arches of time to fulfill them to show that He is faithful and that we can trust Him. And so He fulfills some of His promises the same day we pray to encourage us because we're weak in faith. And He fulfills other promises next week. And some He waits a few months And others he stretches us out for a few years. And others he'll fulfill when he brings us home to glory or when the Lord Jesus returns. Friends, this is the message of the Bible. We have a faithful word of God revealed to us. We should believe it. We should trust him. I love the fact that the great virtue of Abraham is faith. It's trust. You know, when Paul wants to explain the gospel in Romans, who does he go to in Romans 4 as an example of saving faith? He goes to Abraham because Abraham heard God's word, most extraordinary word, and yet because God said it, he believed it. Abraham responded by trusting God's word. Just like Abraham and Eve, uh, just like Adam and Eve didn't in the Garden of Eden, when God spoke in Eden and Adam and Eve didn't trust, didn't obey, just like Jesus did throughout his life, always hearing and believing and obeying, and especially there in the Garden of Gethsemane, trusting the Word of his Heavenly Father. So, friends, as you and I hear and believe God's Word, we begin again to have the relationship with God as he speaks and we believe and trust the very relationship we were made to have. Friends, this is the hope which we can trust and which we should trust because this hope will not disappoint. And this is the hope that we're given in the Bible, the Old and the New Testaments all together. Let's pray together. Lord God, about now when we have just rehearsed your millennial faithfulnesses, our doubts seem large and silly. Oh God, forgive us for our doubts of you. Teach each one of us what it means to trust you fully. Oh God, those very things that you are right now calling us to give up, calling us to embrace, calling us to rest in and trust. Oh God, would you be using your word? Would your spirit be pouring your truth and faith in you into our hearts? that we would believe you for all that you've promised. Bring glory to yourself, even in our own lives, as we trust you for your word. Bring glory to yourself in your churches, we pray. We ask this all for Jesus' sake. Amen.